Okay. Our next speaker here today is Vincent Osman. What? Osavada. <laughs> Uh, Vincent's a long, long time participant of these uh, events, has been coming since I think the Galactic Hacker Party. <laughs> and uh, long career in information security and payment security, but today he's going to be talking about a subject also very close to my heart, boats, and uh, about some of the onboard protocols used and some of the possible vulnerabilities uh, in those. So please give a warm welcome to Vincent Osavada. Thank you so much, and um, welcome to uh, my presentation. Um, first, something about me, as you already mentioned, I'm a long participant in uh, these events. I have a whole bunch of t-shirts at home of all the events I've been. In fact, the only one that I missed was the Intergalactic Hacker Party in Paradiso, because I was too young to travel on my own to Amsterdam by then. Um, but since then, I've been to almost every event that's been held in the uh, Netherlands. Um, I'm also an active sailor, boater, anything that floats or is in the water. Um, I'd like to be on it, and I, I'm uh, enthusiastic about it. And I'm a crew member. I've been sailing uh, a lot of miles across the sea, um, and I'm a real enthusiastic boater. In my daily life, I am uh, active in the payment security industries. I'm a QSA. So anyone that has anything to do with payments uh, probably has hated me as your PCI auditor. But that's not what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk today about boats and about uh, security and safety on board and uh, with ships. Um, we are, uh, uh, and I'm talking about we because my colleague Rogier was here in the room. Uh, we did all the research and all the stuff together, so uh, we owe a big thanks to, uh, to him as well. Um, and we have been taking a look on how secure or insecure the design and the communications of vessels and inter-vessel communication is. Um, which one of you has any prior knowledge of boating over any? So, that's, that's very good. Um, we came to this talk after research of a lot of onboard electronics, um, and it has been a road that brought us uh, into places. We went to Barcelona to go to one of the biggest harbors in uh, Europe in order to uh, have a look at how big super yachts are uh, actually protected uh, for their onboard systems. Here you can see Rogier on uh, the dock of the ship in Barcelona. Not showing on the picture is the security cam, which was right above him and filming everything for this Russian billionaire yacht where we are sitting at. Um, but we've also done some research on our own vessels. So this is uh, my sailing yacht, and you can see her on a sunny day, but it hasn't always been sunny, so then we moved downstairs and went into the uh, boat itself. As we take a look at boats, this is what people normally perceive of uh, boat navigation. Um, in ancient times, boat navigation was just a steering wheel to get the ship from island to island, but now it looks more like a cockpit of an aircraft or a, a, a lot of screens. So this is actually a picture of a large vessel, and this is a picture of the marine control center in Den Helder, where they track all the, um, all the uh, ships. You can see a radar screen. Um, just on this screen, and you can see a map up there which displays every target that is in the sea currently. So this um, central command uh, is able to safeguard all the uh, ships into docks or into harbors uh, across the Netherlands, which is quite important because Netherlands harbors one of the largest uh, harbors in uh, Europe. It's the second largest uh, harbor, so it's always a very busy shipping lane up there. This is a, a, a glass bridge uh, on a modern uh, normal yacht. And you can see here that modern navigation is more in screens. All these screens are just available on consumer electronics. This is just regular consumer electronics, which is fitted on a yacht that is uh, normally, which, which you can normally drive yourself. 
Um, and of course, for all the sailors uh, uh, among us, this looks familiar. Here you can see how navigation takes place on a sailing vessel. In fact, you have the same data which is uh, important uh, for your safe passage. And why is that important? Um, in uh, 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 onboard systems and safe navigation has always been a very important part of marine uh, traffic. Um, you can see a paper map in here, which is not something from the Wayback Machine, but in fact it's still the predominant way of navigating right now if you're on a vessel. Every boater has his paper charts and still has to learn how to navigate with all these old-fashioned tools um, like a ruler and a pencil. Modern ships um, do have some advance advancements. Uh, ships normally have sensors that sensor every part of the ship in order to safeguard uh, a safe and comfortable passage. And why is that important? As you know, ships do not, cannot see the road, so you do not see how deep it is on the water. You cannot see how quickly you are moving. And by uh, navigating on the water, you also have to do with tides and with waves and with wind. So it's necessary to have the proper amount of sensory electronics in order to measure how your ship is moving towards a safe and navigational passage. And there's one just one law of the sea that you immediately learn if you ever venture on any trip outside the inland waters, that the rule of the sea is good seamanship is rule number one. So whatever your legislator is telling you, whatever the local laws are, good seamanship and safe passage is rule number one. So what are, we, what are the typical sensors that we need? We, we have a sailing yacht here, but this is also true for any other yacht. Every boat owner knows about these because they always break. You always have to refit them uh, uh, once in a while. So we have a depth sensor, we have a wind sensor, you have a temperature sensor, which temperatures the sea, and you have a speed sensor. This is just the regular basics of any vessel. There's, it's normal what you need here. Um, as you can see, by the way, Sorry for the slides. All these sensors, they communicate with each other um, uh, along a bus, and a, the orange line, which ends up at the end of the ship where the people that steer the ship receive these data on these screens. So you've got the temperature, you've got the depth, you've got the wind meter up here, and you've got the, uh, the sensors up there. This has all also uh, done some sensors up there. So if we take a close look at these uh, systems, what are these actual systems? These systems are analog systems that produce analog da data and send it over to uh, screens and to measurement needles. So on the left part, you have a measurement needle that is uh, uh, viewable by the captain or by the skipper, and then all these sensors produce any data and they send it along to the bus. And this bus is speaking a protocol which is called NMIA 0183. This NMIA protocol is part of a standard. It's not a normal protocol, it's a protocol that's being used for a lot of uh, stuff, and it's a standard published by the National Marine Electronics Association. And why is it published there, and why did they make it? They made it so you have interoperability between different vendors and different systems. And you probably know about it because this is also the protocol that many GPS systems output. Also, uh, GPS systems that are just a household GPS systems output uh, NMIA 0183. And if you take a close look at it, you can see that it's a protocol based on serial links. Well, we know about serial links because we are in the IT stuff, so we know what serial links are and what they, what they do. One of the things... Uh, one of the things important is that a device has a certain role. A device can either be a talker or it can be a listener. Uh, and you can only have one talker and multiple listeners in theory on a system. So that is the reason why you have, for example, one depth sensor and you can see that into multiple screens. Um, these are examples of NMIA 0183 system, uh, messages. You can see them just by clear text. You can see them just going around with a message and with a uh, data block, just as we would normally perceive. This is if you take a close look at it, and you can see some IA and some other uh, traffic as well, because you can easily capture that if you have the right equipment. Um, NMIA 0183 was designed in 1983. Uh, 1983, 
uh, this was 1983. Which of you has been born before 1983? So, and after. So, these systems were being developed before you were born. This is what the current uh, fashion industry was in 1983. And you also may, might have one of these cameras sitting at grandfather's or grandmother's home. The computer show was introduced uh, by then, and of course, everyone had access to your computer by a telephone. So this was the year, just to give you a slide, uh, just to give you some examples, this was the year when one of the predominant protocols was being born and was being made that is still in use on all commercial vessels in the sea and on uh, our waters. So in 1983, we didn't have encryption. We didn't have any authentication. We didn't have confidentiality. In fact, the old CIA triangle, which is a normal concept in information security, was not there then. Security was just not an issue in 1983. Skip through it to today. You can see that EMEA 0183 is still the predominant standard. But as time advances, some people have more requirements on their traffic. So, a new protocol was being built in 2000, and you can already guess what name it was. It was EMEA 2K. EMEA 2K added some extra stuff to the protocol, which can be used on a vessel. So, it added the possibility to do high-speed communications over your bus. And it also changed the way how these systems worked. In EMEA 183, you had one talker, multiple listeners, you had a link between one device and another, but it changed in EMEA 0200. The concept of a bus was introduced, and also prioritization. So in order to make sure that all stuff was uh, being able to work on your boat, no one thought of replacing this, uh, this stuff. No, let's just build a converter. So today's systems still speak EMEA 0183. But in order to read them out on sophisticated, uh, sophisticated equipment, we have a converter box which converts these standard messages into a bus. And as you all know, if you're talking about a bus, if you're talking about a converter, you can easily do a lot of stuff that you probably don't want. That's not all. In recent times, we've seen the development of wireless connections towards your ship. And of course, any vessel is not a real vessel if you're not able to do it by the Wi-Fi. So we have on the left part, on, on that part of the screen, we have our multifunctional device that is capable of reading out all your systems in your ship, which is, uh, in this example, communicating with a new kind of radar device over Wi-Fi. Um, on the uh, middle part, you have this converter, which uh, transmits Wi-Fi towards your uh, normal systems. And why did we do it? It was new, it was never seen before, it's a state-of-the-art technology, you don't want to ship without Wi-Fi, you don't need any wires, it's perfect. But it does have some disadvantages. Because if you're able to connect to a radar, um, wait a second, if you're able to connect on the Wi-Fi network on a radar, you cannot see which device is connecting towards it. So, let's have a look at it. Under the hood, this radar dome, which is uh, one of the most popular radar domes right now, is a radar built by the uh, uh, radar production company called FLIR. Um, Wi-Fi security was not implemented there. They actually didn't put any Wi-Fi in there. They built a chip, and this chip uh, converts CAN bus traffic, which is the normal standard for industrial applications, towards Wi-Fi. And if you install it on a standard vessel, it doesn't come with any Wi-Fi security. Uh, oh, wait a sec. Doesn't that make it possible to log into your ship over Wi-Fi if you have such a radar dome? And it's also quite easy to walk on the docks and see if the radar dome is up there. You almost immediately know, ah, the ship does have Wi-Fi and I can connect to it. But there's more. You can also connect your iPad or your laptop uh, wireless to your ship. Um, this is an example of uh, a chart in here, 
where we are connecting our iPad towards the ship. The ship, the iPad is just receiving its connection from the converter and it's just receiving its connection from uh, all the data from the bus. Um, and let's make it very easily. Uh, we can also add an app which allows us to view all the data in the ship. And in order to make stuff more easy, we can even control the ship over Wi-Fi without any wireless security. Um, this control is a little bit, uh, it's a, a, you can just download it, but um, we took a look on it and have uh, taken a look what's behind this control sequence. And in fact, it just turns out to be regular RTSP traffic. So let's just try to see if we can have uh, this uh, uh, data from the ship over on my own laptop or on my own machines. That's kind of easy. I just open my VLC, which I normally use for any other movies, and I can connect to my ship and have all the stuff in your uh, ship. Um, this is just a viewing stuff, so uh, let's not make it worse, except if you install one of these. So these are the autopilots. An autopilot is vital if you take a long passage because you don't want to steer it by hand. So you have these autopilots that actually rely on all the sensory information that is coming towards these autopilots. This is an autopilot system where you can see the same device which is for monitoring. You can see in here this is a steering, steering uh, machine which steers the stuff and this is uh, the, uh, a radar dome and uh, uh, some other equipment in order to, uh, a, a, a gyroscope in order to balance out the ship. Um, but if we are able to connect to the ship, we can also um, um, uh, uh, modify this autopilot and make sure that it, for example, steers uh, uh, around depth or it can do other stuff. So you can easily control it and it's even more essential if you have such a system which is connecting to the Wi-Fi as well and you can easily uh, configure um, your ship. So. When you own the sensors, you can inject data that is used by onboard systems. If you saw in the previous slide, you can see it. For example, you can, we can add depth detection, we can add uh, stuff in it, and we can inject it over the Wi-Fi. We can easy, even uh, do uh, man-overboard procedures, but communications get a lot worse if you look at AIS. AIS is a, uh, a, a, a specific protocol on systems to uh, monitor all the shipping activity in your environment. So this is a chart of the Netherlands where you can see some AIS targets. These are the blue ones, and the blue ones are ships that actually uh, uh, are, are able are, are floating in the sea. It is a mesh-like uh, uh, system where all devices send out AIS messages, and it uses VHF as its main carrier, and it sends encoded data on there. You need an MMSI number, and you're either a transponder or a receiver. If you're a receiver, you only receive data, and if you're a transponder, you can also transmit it. This protocol is protected, so um, you need to have a maritime license and you need to have a radio license in order to operate equipment that is used uh, for AIS. And all the equipment on board must be certified. Um, that is the only safeguard that there is. So you can only buy certified equipment. Um, the equipment should function completely standalone, uh, including uh, its internal GPS system. So you cannot send GPS data towards any AIS system. It has to have its internal GPS. Um, large and commercial vessels are required to have such a system on board. It's not optional. You are required to have it in order to identify yourself. But if we want to have a look at that, we actually only need something that can send AIS. And as I already explained, you only, it's only protected by the fact that you, cannot, you only have to buy certif uh, certified equipment. So AIS transponders are protected by law, but uh, it's just VHF. So any device that can send out on the VHF frequency would be able to send out AIS me messages. And let's have a look. This system is an SDR, it's a software-defined radio, so you can program anything in it and it can be anything you want. It can be an FM radio, it can be a walkie-talkie, it can be a taxi sensor, but it can also be a VHF. And if it can be a VHF, we can use it to send data out of it. So, that's what we did. Um, 
AIS is a, 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 an insecure protocol because you can actually send it. But by researching in it and by testing it, um, you are crossing the boundary of illegal stuff because you are transmitting on frequencies that you're not supposed to be and you're using equipment that you're not supposed to be. So what you're going to see here on, this, on, this, on the slides is an SDR which is turned to an open frequency. So we modify the number that you can see up there in towards an open frequency that is public uh, in use and we throw down the uh, power transmission in order to not disturb the other traffic. And doing this on the official AIS frequencies would be potentially harmful and I wouldn't suggest that you do that for testing purposes. Um, so if we can send out AIS, let's see if we can easily do that. So we have this uh, screen, uh, so can we uh, actually send out AIS? Yes, we have installed the right tooling, we have patched some, some stuff in order to make it work. And in fact, if you can uh, look in, in here, you can see on the official map, you can see uh, one vessel appearing up here. Um, that's not how it's supposed to be, because this map on the right side, or on your on the right side, is the official map where uh, authorities monitor ship activity. So we just protected, projected a ship which actually is not there. So any presentation on Shah wouldn't be a presentation without Bob and Alice. So what happens if we can impersonate uh, ourselves to be someone else? I just projected uh, a ship up there, but can we project to be someone else? So this is my sailing vessel with my MMS ID, which is on the top part. So would we be able to modify this MMS ID in order to, for example, put a larger ship in here? So any, any enthusiastic army lover would immediately recognize this as the USS Nimitz, one of the bigger uh, flight uh, ships in, um, uh, in the US Navy. Um, and of course, it's a little bit hard to understand that the Nimitz is actually turning up just before Van Huysen. You can see this is the Nimitz, and this is the screen, and this is the display that other people would see if they would monitor their uh, IAS stuff right now. You can see here, it's the, this is the ship, and the length of the line indicates the current speed as it is received by the viewer right now. So this is the ID of the Nimitz, and you can see here the speed of ground, it's going about 100 knots. If you can actually see it, it's going really fast and everything and stuff. So is this pretty new? Well, it's um, uh, something that you can easily figure out if you have a look at it and if you, uh, uh, if you know how VHF works. But there is a little problem in here. And the problem comes if we are going to take a look at why we are using AIS. So, you, of course, know that you're on a ship and you can see the surrounding on your so you can see that the USS Nimitz is not there. Um, but there are some applications where you won't be able to see it. And this application is a very special application that is a very dangerous field. This application is what we call, and it's, it's going to be a tongue breaker for me, it's going to be a virtual buoy in English, or buoy, 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 buoy. <laughs> So this is a virtual buoy that's um, laid out in the, in, the, in the water. And this is actually what you're going to see if you're on deck of your ship. You're going to see absolutely nothing. You're going to see water. You're not going to see the red or the green view in the water. But you're going to see on your maps, you're going to see one of these signs. Because some system is sending out these views towards your system and telling your onboard navigation system, well, you have to display a virtual buoy here, so you can safely uh, guard your ship around it. So these are some options of the views that you can see. And this is in fact a map of a uh, US uh, territory, where you can see on the arrows, you can see how a buoy is represented on a chart. It's just a regular chart, you can just see the buoy popping up because someone is transmitting that. So let's dive a little bit deeper into that, because that might be interesting. Would we be able to have a look at these views that are virtual, that are being used in commercial traffic, that are being laid out, that someone's going to see, and we can just send them out? So this is what you, and um, maybe it's a little bit hard to see, but this is actually the message that you're going to send. 
So and there you can also see why this is a, uh, an important stuff. You can send all kind of commands to a ship, for example, say, well, you have to avoid this area, you have to go to that area, this is an obligated area to go, take care because there's a shipwreck under there, or take care there's uh, uh, no depth in there. Um, in fact, it's currently uh, widespread in use on wind farms in order to make sure that you're not uh, entering an illegal area of a wind farm. A, a wind farm, you, you cannot just go through it, you cannot uh, 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 go to, towards a wind park, there's a perimeter which is secured, but there's no way to put a perimeter fence or anything on the water, so they are using virtual tonnage up there. But hey, wait a sec, if we can impersonate the USS Nimitz to be in the isomere, can we also impersonate some views? Can we also think of a view and say, well, let's make a virtual view up there? Well, that's something that we tried, and yes, we can. Yes, we can do that, and in here you can see a map, and you can see, if you look, this is uh, also a map of the Netherlands, but we could have done this anywhere at all. You can see the uh, island of Mark and in here, and you can see Volendam up there. And we decided, well, let's have a look. Can we, can we put a view on there? And can we, well, this is a little bit of a, uh, it's not a, uh, it's a movie that's being a little bit quicker than normal. Um, but yes, we can, so we, we, we uh, yes, we can put in views here. So we tried to make a race track on views and see if uh, any ships would be able to follow this. You can see this is a special kind of view, it's a, called a North Cardinal Mark, which uh, uh, protects something on the south of it. Well, this is what we actually did on the... On the, on the so any uh, traffic guidance uh, or any control uh, tower that was actually watching the screen at that time would uh, see the displays of these virtual views. They, they are not there, of course, but um, would be able to see what's uh, going in here. Any ship which is there would have seen uh, it as well. We've filtered out all the other ships up there. So this is what we um, uh, uh, see of a, a problematic part of um, uh, AIS traffic. Um, but there's more. You have several attack vectors on any public channel. So you can do resource starvation, of course. Uh, it's easy to do denial of service attack because there's a little time frame where this VHF uh, traffic is uh, going through. But you can also de easily do a poisoning attack or send false data. In fact, it goes wrong because this ship had uh, an accident uh, uh, a short while ago where this big uh, US-based chip didn't turn on its AIS, and a Japanese ship ran into it. Um, it the, the, the tragedy in here is it's completely IIS-based. Um, so we know that it doesn't meet the standard requirements of confidentiality and integrity and availability, the stuff that we think is important if you look at uh, information security. And we are also aware of several attack factors, what, what you are seeing in here. Um, uh, we've seen other stuff being presented at uh, uh, Hack in the Box and Black Hat that's uh, 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 targeted towards the same area. So the most logical thing, of course, to do right now is implement this. So this is an official publication of the Dutch Coast Guard, which is sent out to all the uh, people that uh, are on the sea. Um, it's uh, an, an, an official uh, statement that we're going to replace all the real buoys by virtual buoys. And we don't think that's a very smart idea if you can easily uh, falsify them and easily send them away. So, in fact, AAS virtual atoms are currently being deployed worldwide. They are currently being deployed worldwide and they are currently in use for uh, wreckage of uh, ships, of protection of wind farms, of uh, fencing out uh, no-go areas, of uh, uh, um, uh, port authorities to safeguard and make sure that, for example, refugee boats do not enter a certain line before the coast. And it's implemented in several countries as real views. In fact, some of uh, the, uh, in America, they say, let's bring the America's waterways into the 21st century by replacing all the current views for virtual views. So AIS is inherently insecure in boating as well. There's no authentication or encryption, and its channel is insecure. 
And we know that, and we have been here before. Uh, so let's hope that we can use the lessons learned from the IT stuff to make the water world a little bit safer and more secure. And of course, keep on boating anywhere. Anyway, thank you. So, any questions? Uh, if you have questions, could you please come up to the microphones, please? Yeah, this is a perfect way of uh, <laughs> doing the Q&A &A part. But any questions on, uh, on this part? So, do I, do I understand it correctly that the only limit to this kind of attack of uh, fake buoys uh, would be to, to figure out who is sending and uh, to shut him down. C could you repeat the question? Yeah. Uh, do I understand it correctly that the only defense against uh, this attack is to find who is sending and to shut him down? Yes. In fact, that's the only, only, only real solution to add some thing like integrity or some kind like a, a, a source uh, uh, stuff because you cannot see who is transmitting it right now. That's the only way that you can actually uh, resolve the issue. It doesn't mean that you don't have any other options. For example, uh, uh, we know some firms that have been uh, active in building uh, 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 an IDS for uh, some, but what we call an IDS for AIS systems. But they were asked to shut that down because of this insecurity uh, stuff. So um, there are some, some small fixes, but the only real fix would be to put in some authentication on the system or on the station that is sending out. And what is, what is the, the typical sending power or the, the typical reach of, uh, of this kind of system? Well, the, the typical reach of um, uh, AIS doesn't have any, any power uh, limit, so you can send it out easily. But the main problem is that um, um, we currently have a few uh, important systems like marine traffic or vessel finder that has sensors all over the place to censor any data and replicate it and make sure that it's being sent towards the whole world. Um, these systems are very important in order to have a view of your whole world. But the main problem is that um, these stations are public. So you can just drive up to them and do an injection on it. Uh, and it's being propagated all around the world. Next question. Do buoys also uh, monitor their own location? Uh, do buoys also monitor their own location and uh, transmit errors if uh, the, well, a chain comes loose or something like that? No. Um, the, the question was that if, if does a buoy also send its own location? So would you be able to have a look at the system that, that's sending it and, and having a, 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 some kind of a source coordinate and, and check against it? But unfortunately, it, it's not required. Um, the protocol allows you to send it, but it's not required. And it's, um, there are many instances where it's not being used because some of the equipment can't handle all the data fields that are in the packet. So unfortunately, that's uh, not a real, very good alternative. <laughs> Hello, um, I'm not so into boats, but <laughs> I like uh, planes. So I do uh, plane, uh, how do you call it, uh, uh, looking at the sky with uh, also some kind of uh, device and see what planes passes my house. I was thinking about uh, how, how is this, do you know anything about the aviation world? Is, could, could you impersonate a plane? Uh, yes, you could, because uh, AIS is being, uh, it's not only used in the marine world, it's also used in the flight world, but it does have some, some extra stuff, uh, it does have some extra uh, features in there, but it's also used in, the, in, the, in, the, uh, uh, in that world. But there's some different because you have there you have uh, just a sending station and one receiving station and in the marine world you have multiple receiving stations and multiple sending stations so you just have uh, uh, one ship can send it out to anyone who is going to listen so but the AIS system in terms is the, is the same yeah. uh, earlier in the talk you were talking about uh, the GPS units that that had basically no security on it 
So would it basically be possible to um, tell the GPS unit to shut down, imitate the GPS unit, say that the boat is at a certain location and have it steer wherever you want by yes. in injecting the location? Yes, that is a, a doable attack. You can do it. You can open up your box and uh, just put in another GPS. By um, design, uh, or by the certificate of these units do not allow you to have an external GPS. But any hardware hacker would immediately open up the thing and put in its own GPS because it's just a different, different thing. It's just a different module on it. So any smart uh, soldering uh, king would be able to uh, modify this and send its own GPS. By default, an AIS system uh, with its internal GPS can only send out its internal GPS coordinates. But if you can modify those, which is pretty easy, you have a very good attack factor in order to have to ship think while well, I'm somewhere else or have like the autopilot or have the onboard systems steer you towards a goal that you probably do not want to go to. Yeah, I was thinking not even with the AIS, just the, the, the GPS, you, you showed a picture of the thing and I assume that goes to the to the pilot, it's the autopilot itself, without going through AIS. Or? Yep. So, so it's going to be this uh, this uh, picture you, th you mean? Well, where we have the GPS, of course, which is in uh, in uh, in this box. You, it's very easy to poison this and send out your own GPS data. In fact, what you uh, need for that is not so much. It's um, uh, where do, did I have the strings, the EMEA strings? Well, I, I just showed you the picture of the EMEA strings. They're just here. Uh, I'll show them again. So this is what's coming over your bus. So you can, if as soon as you have access to your bus by doing the Wi-Fi, you can send out any of these messages. So you can send out your time position of your data. You can have so all the G stuff is all the GPS uh, stuff, uh, uh, GPS messages. And in fact, if you if you look at this, this is a live capture of what we saw. So this GPS traffic is coming by, and you can easily poison your ship and make sure that. The EMEA bus contains an extra GPS uh, uh, signal, and your um, uh, uh, equipment does not know where it's coming from because there's no way to see it because it's being converted. The old protocol is being converted in to another protocol, and there all the source information is lost. It's just originating from. It's actually it's acting like a net net proxy in IT terms. So. Any device that's behind it can send it, and there's no way that the onboard systems actually know which system is sending it. No. Any other questions? Good. Thank you so much.